Welcome to Family Bible Time. We are in Zechariah chapter 4. We're in John chapter 7. Zechariah 4, John 7. Let's pray. Let's go. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you for your help. We need you, Lord, all the time. We need you. Please open our eyes to see wonderful things in your law. Forgive us our sins. Teach us the truth. Teach us your ways, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. All right, the angel of the Lord and the angel who talked to me. Sorry, let me just restart that. The angel And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And you say, well, what's he sleeping for? Maybe he had the same kind of exhaustion that Daniel had after having some of his visions. Mm. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, um, behold, I, I, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there were two. There are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? <laughs> now that's a reasonable question, mm -hmm. isn't it? Can you figure it out? Mm -mm. It's not actually the easiest of the visions. It is possible, but it's not the easiest of the visions to kind of figure out. Um... But the angel seemed to think it was fairly obvious. The angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what mm -hmm. these are? I said, No, my lord. Mm -hmm. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not this vision is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. But this overall, this message, this whole thing is gives the message, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Mm. All right, this is the message that you're supposed to get from the vision. Not by my, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become, before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stones amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Now, who was Zerubbabel? Oh, yes, Zerubbabel was the descendant of David who was rebuilding all the rubbable and turning it into a temple. Bubble. Just a temple. Not a temple bubble. Not a temple bubble, no. <laughs> a temple out of the rubbable. <laughs> so, Zerubbabel was in the place of being like the king in Judah. And verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Who's me? Hmm, the angel. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. What's a plumb line? Oh yes, a weight on a bit of string that they use for building things vertically. Yeah, so what, what's going on here? The temple's being rebuilt, but this is an encouragement from God to Zerubbabel to keep going because God is going to help him. It's not going to be by his might, it's not going to be by his power, it's going to be by his spirit. He's going to need the help of the Lord to do his work, to get it done. And then, if he does have the house of the help of the Lord, which he will, he's going to finish it. And the people who previously were grieving over the tiny size of it, mm. they, they, and, and how small it all was compared to before, they're going to see, praise the Lord, he's helping us. Mm. So, that's the message. Now, um, here comes the interpretation. 
because he's waited till now to give an interpretation mm. of the vision. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range throughout through the whole earth. Then I said to him, so, so that's the lamps, right? The eyes of the Lord. And then I said to him, what are the two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, what are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? He said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. And he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the, of the whole earth. And you're right. Oh, good. Well, that's clear then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or maybe you could do with thinking about it a bit more like me. Oh, this this vision is interesting, isn't it? So the, what is it? It's, it's a lampstand, seven branches, but with a bot like the lamp in the temple, right? Mm -hmm. But this one has a big bowl on top. What's the bowl for? It's full of oil. And the oil is being is just channeled down into the lamps to keep them burning. So it's like, this is like a lampstand that never runs out of oil. And then there's the trees. And the two trees are olive trees, but they're supplying oil. They've got these branches and, and there's these little pipes and they're supplying the oil to the bowl. So this is just like a never-ending supply of oil for the lamps. This is a lamp that's never going to go out. Now, the point behind the whole picture is, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So it's God, it's a picture of God supplying everything that's needed. God's eyes are on the whole thing, seven seven lamps, God sees everything, but the whole business of the light, the provision of light, understanding, knowledge, um, searching, sight of God, all of that, all of that, the provision for it is all constant, it's never going to run out, all supplied by God. It's kind of like a perpetual energy source. <laughs> <laughs> never running out, the battery that never runs out. Now, um, the whole message is is, is going to be, um, this, this is going to be accomplished by the Spirit. However, there are these details. The two olive trees, who are they? And then comes the answer. These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. You're like, which two anointed ones? What's he mean? Hmm. Interesting, the word anointed ones means sons of oil or sons of new oil and would perhaps refer, maybe it's best to interpret it as referring to the two offices, one of the office of priest, the priest stood before the Lord to minister for the people, and one, the office of the king. The king was another anointed person, wasn't he? So the, remember they anointed David and they anointed Saul and they anointed the kings. They also anointed the priests. So anointed ones kind of makes sense for those two offices of priest and king. And you say, why are the two offices not the... Well, none of the individuals <coughs> kind of fit this description... But the, the office of king and the office of priest was one way that the Lord worked by the power of the Spirit with the people of Israel, the people of Judah in days gone by. He, he employed the Spirit of God was upon the king to help exercise God's authority over the people. So the king was kind of imposing God's authority on the people when he did it right. And the priests, well, the priests were anointed to be able to intercede with God for the people to keep the relationship going. You would say, keep it all flowing. So there were these two offices, priest and king, 
which were needed in order for God to be able to interact and bless his people. And that was the Old Testament. Of course, the days were going to come when there was going to be one king who was also a priest. Jesus is, about Jesus it says, <coughs> you're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Mm. So, the, so Jesus would be the king and priest and prophet as well. But Jesus would fulfill both of those offices. Mm. And so ultimately, of course, this all points to the Messiah. Um, now, if you want a detailed explanation of all of that, you can go to the MacArthur Old Testament commentary that I've been recommending on Zechariah, <laughs> and it's really good, um, really detailed. MacArthur's study Bible has it in brief, but I, I found it too brief to be able to just kind of get it all in, straight in my head, so that's why sometimes you just got to dig deeper. Mm. Um, okay. That was Zechariah chapter 7. No, it wasn't. That was Zechariah chapter 4. Mm-hmm. Now we're in John chapter 7. All right? John chapter 7. Now, John chapter 7 starts with the words, after this. And you say, after what? Well, after John chapter 6, of course, dummy. But after the events of John chapter 6, if you go back to John chapter 6... And um, verse 4 in John chapter 6, it says, Now the Passover feast, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Mm -hmm. Hmm, Okay. Well, the Passover, that's the same time as our Easter, isn't it? Because it was at the Passover that Jesus had the Last Supper mm. and then was crucified and resurrected. And so we celebrate Easter, Resurrection Sunday, around about the same time as Passover. So that's April-ish, okay? Now in chapter 7, look at verse 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now... The Jews' Feast of Booths was at hand. Ah, hold on. Feast of Booths, when was that? That's about October. Hmm. So there's a like, seven-month gap in between chapter 6 and chapter 7, hmm. which is always interesting, isn't it? Mind the gap. <laughs> um, so his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea. That your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now do you think his brothers had his best interests at heart? Or maybe their own? Hmm. Look at verse 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. Now that's painful, isn't it? Don't ever be surprised if you're misunderstood, misrepresented, disliked for being godly. You think, I'm doing it right. People should like me for this. Mm. Well, hang on a minute. Jesus, (laughs) his own brothers didn't believe in him. You're like, surely... Some of you Christian parents are like, surely my own children, they must believe because they see me up close and they, they can see, I tell them all the time that it's true and they must believe, mustn't they? Well, no, Jesus' brothers didn't believe in him. Mm-hmm. Um, you take people to a sermon, you say, oh, surely if they hear that sermon, mm-hmm. they must believe. Well, no, Jesus' brothers didn't believe in him. It wasn't until after he was resurrected that his brothers believed in him. So, there's no guarantee, is there? That's why parents have to really pray for their children. You have to pray for the people that you try to reach with the gospel. Pray for them. It's, it's, it's a work of God that's needed. It's not just an automatic thing. It's not, it's not the product 
of just words. All right. Anyway, for not even his brothers believed in him. Verse 6, Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it, that its works are evil. Ouch, well they obviously weren't testifying about it, that its works were evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Now there's a problem here, because you, you maybe know this, but verse 9 says, after, he remained, after saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. And you can get really in trouble over this if you think, oh, Jesus lied. <laughs> that could send you off into a tailspin. Mm -hmm. um, we'll look at the footnote in verse 8, first of all. I am not, the footnote says, some, man, some, manuscript, some, some manuscripts add, Yet, I'm not yet going up to this feast. Now, I don't actually think that those manuscripts that add the word yet, I don't think they're the most, it's the, the, I don't think the arguments for them being the original are very persuasive, let's put it like that. I think the original probably just said, I'm not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. And he said, well, but then how is Jesus not lying to his brothers? Maybe someone put in here the word yet in those early manuscripts to try and make it look as though Jesus wasn't... Because they're embarrassed. They're thinking, well, did Jesus lie to his brothers? So how is he not lying if... Yes, go on, Karis. Can he have changed his mind? Yeah, do you know what? I think you said that last time we read this. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right. Exactly that. He changed his mind. I think that's what happened. Because I don't see a problem with Jesus changing his mind. Because Jesus was truly human, wasn't he? He was truly a man. He became tired. At Lazarus' tomb, he says, where have you laid him? He, now, either that's faking it, or he actually doesn't know. Um... Well, if he doesn't know, then his human mind doesn't have access to his divine omniscience. What's omniscience? The fact that he knows everything. But if, if his human mind doesn't have constant access to his divine omniscience all the time, um, then he truly didn't know where they'd laid Lazarus. If his human mind didn't have access to his divine omniscience all the time, then it's genuine when, he, when it says he grew in wisdom. And he had to learn the language as a baby. And he had to learn the scriptures as a child. And when he debated and gave answers to the, to the teachers of the law in the temple... It wasn't a fake. He wasn't like playing at being a child. He was a child. And they were amazed at his answers. <clears throat> he was a perfect child. He wasn't sinner. Sin hadn't corrupted his, his thinking in the same way. But he was still a human being and growing and learning and mm. remembering things. I think that's really helpful because also that would include decisions. So Jesus, at this point, um, is saying, no, he's, he's, if you imagine Jesus living in, in relationship with his Father by prayer, the way we have to live in relationship with God, but without sin, without failure, he's depending on God constantly. He's waiting on the Lord, and it, here's his decision at this point. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. He's talking about the time for him to be revealed um, to Israel as the Messiah. And 
Um, so he remains behind. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. That's not fake. That's genuine. It's a decision to stay there. But then, presumably, the Lord, in dependence on the Father, in, in relationship with God, he gets more information and, and he decides to go up. Why? Because he's presumably had more revelation from the Father to say, yes, okay, now is the time to go up. So verse 10, but after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not privately, not publicly, but in private. Okay, so does that help solve that, that difficulty? I think that's legit. I don't have a problem with it. I think the only way you can have a problem with it is if you've if you've got a kind of predisposition to want it to be a problem, um, people do that. Anyway, verse 11. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and were saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he's never studied? Now that's interesting. That just meant he'd never been to one of their universities, one of their rabbinical schools that existed. So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching whether the teaching that is my teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because if you do really want to find out the truth. You will, won't you? If you really want to do God's will, you can figure out, is Jesus telling the truth or not? Or is he making it up? Anyway, verse 18, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one deed and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken... Are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? <laughs> Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. He's really calling them out, isn't mm. he? Some of the people of Jerusalem said, therefore said, Is this not is is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly and saying they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that he is the Christ? this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from? But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true. And him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Now that's where he started, isn't it? My time has not yet come. His hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. And the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you 
a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying you will seek me and you will not find me? And where I am you cannot come. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have has said, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now you remember this. So John 14, 17, we'll get there, but Jesus says to the disciples, the Spirit is with you, but will be in you. And he says, I'm going away in chapter 14. He says, I'm going to, you should be glad that I'm going away because I'm going to send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, right, to be with you forever. So, so there's this change. Jesus goes to the Father, but when he goes to the Father, he sends the Spirit. And, you know, the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. Mm. That's when the Spirit fell upon them. And they were baptised in the Spirit. And every believer, when you become a believer now, you're baptised in the Spirit. And so you're, the Spirit is upon every believer. In fact, Paul in Romans 8, verse 9, says, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to him. He's none of his. So you, you, you can't say any Christian does not have the Spirit. Every Christian has been baptised in the Spirit, immersed in the Spirit. The Spirit lives in us. Paul said to the Corinthians, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Who is in you? In you. So every Christian has the Holy Spirit in you. John calls the Spirit the anointing that we have from the Father. And just as we have an anointing, you know, just like every Christian has it. So this is interesting because as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus needed to die, to ascend into heaven and to be glorified. And then, presumably after those days, send the Spirit at Pentecost. And that was when the Spirit was given. All right, verse 40, and when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? Mm -hmm. Like, well, dummies, just do a bit of... Mm -mm inquiry like Luke did and you'd have found out that's where Jesus was born mm -hmm. anyway so there was a division among the people over him some of them wanted to arrest him but no one laid their hands on him the officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them why did you not bring him the officers answered no one ever spoke like this man the Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities of, or the Pharisees believed in him? Well, now, what does that remind you of? Actually, yes, there was one, wasn't there? Mm. Which Pharisee believed in him? Nicodemus. Yeah, look at this. And then he speaks up. Verse 49, But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. What an arrogant statement okay. to make. It's the same kind of arrogance that so many scientists have today and so many preachers too. 
when they just say, look, if we can't find it, if we don't understand it, mm-hmm. if we can't see it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, well, a little bit, a bit more humility would go a long way, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Lord, we pray that you would give us the humble spirit of those soldiers and to be able to just listen to the words of Jesus and say what's true. No one ever spoke like this. Thank you that you are the light of the world. Thank you that you came down. Thank you that we can trust you. Lord, please teach us and shine that light in our own hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. We're done for today and we'll be back if the Lord wills and we live tomorrow. Till then, goodbye.